Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. I'm Sarah Watt. I'm Max Tarrant. And I'm William Chen. And each month at Cinema in Context, we discuss two films, one current and one retrospective, with some connection. It could be the same director, the same actor, or a similar theme. And this month, we're going for the same director. Two films directed by Taika Waititi, who hails from our beautiful country of Aotearoa. And the new film is Thor Ragnarok, which came out a few weeks ago. And Hunt for the Wilder People, which came out last year, 2016. So, who would like to give us a summary of Hunt for the Wilder People? Hunt for the Wilder People came out in 2016, as Jeremy says, starring an unknown face in the form of Julian Dennison as a young foster child called Ricky Baker, who is sent to live with um, a lovely couple played by Sam Neill and Rima Tewiata, Uh, who take him under their wing, uh, and then when things get troublesome for young Ricky Baker and the state wishes to uh, take him back into care, he goes on the run into the bush. Uh, He goes bush, I suppose we would say, uh, if we were Australian, Um, uh, with Sam Neill. And so we have that lovely sort of odd couple relationship um, that unfurls uh, in a bit of an action movie, Serious throwbacks to 1980s Taika Waititi isms, uh, and all the things that we know and love. And I think it's worth noting as well that it's based on a novel by Barry Crump. Uh, was it Wild Pork and Watercress? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember studying that at Intermediate, so it sort of echoes of the story popped up in my head as I was watching the film. But yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and Thor Ragnarok. Alrighty, Thor Ragnarok is what, like the the 19th Marvel movie? Oh, I don't know. Right. There's so many of them. So many. Uh, it is the third Thor movie um, about the Norse god of thunder and his adventures on Earth and, and the, the, the cosmic wilderness of outer space. And in this one, Thor, as he says himself, undergoes a, a journey of self-discovery where he is stranded on a very strange uh, junk alien planet and needs to find a way off-world and save his home of Asgard from the upcoming end of creation, Ragnarok. The very, yeah, Ragnarok, isn't it? It's sort of mm-hmm. such a ridiculous word that they sort of try and explain, but <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be one of the weirdest named films in, in cinema history. Great, thank you. And it's worth noting that we at Cinema Context typically like to uh, keep our new film spoiler-free, our discussion spoiler-free, uh, and the retrospective film we feel is fair game. So we will be talking about spoilers for Hunt for the Wilder People. Um, however, it's always great, I think, to watch the films beforehand, in my opinion. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I think the sort of stuff we talk about, we, we're usually coming from a place of having a, a strong understanding of the movies. Um, so yeah, up to you how you engage with this, but that's where we're at. Okay, who would like to start us off? Hunt for the Wilder People. It's fantastic. I love that film. Um, it's so nicely paced uh, at the beginning. The, the first act is beautiful. So nicely introduced. We get this... Uh, lovely uh, involvement with the location uh, which is obviously a beautiful um, New Zealand forest landscape out in the countryside and it's just set up in such a nice way such a simple clear way and when uh, the mother dies which I assume you're trying to avoid there but sorry about that but Mm -hmm. it's not not really a spoiler the stepmother yeah yeah, it's a great twist I love Mm. that little simple setup of the story and by far the first act is, is my favourite part about it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And the pacing of this film is just really lovely. It just, you know, I never feel bored when I watch this film because it just moves along so nicely. Mm-hmm. But I agree that the introduction of the, all those characters is really strong. And the, the auntie character, she is such a force that I forget each time I watch her that she is only... She is only in it for mm. the first 20 minutes mm. or whatever it is. Mm. And even though, you know, her, her passing is, is not forgettable by any means, it's a very tragic part of the film. The, the strength of that character is she, she, she is through the film. She lasts, yeah. She's there yeah. through the film, whether yeah. she's on screen or not. Yeah. Um, and they do talk about it a bit later on, don't they, when, when they go to the lake. What is it? The lake in the sky or something? Yeah, the lake that touches the sky, mm. which they never really get to, do they? They sort of find somewhere That's that right. vaguely could be that place. This it is really, a nice metaphorical kind it, of... It really speaks to um, Waititi's knack for pathos, doesn't it? As mm. well as humour, which mm. obviously we'll get onto significantly about his humour. Mm. But it's so beautiful because I think that the, the foster relationship is just gorgeous. And even though you've got the curmudgeonly Sam Neill character, um, Uncle... Heck. 
uncle would get it, that's right, don't call me uncle, and all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, even that is desperately moving. And Heck's mm. love for the auntie and his mm. grief is desperately moving as well. And so really pitched really beautifully, isn't it, that you've got some hilariously, hilar- characters who are hilarious in their own right, but that who put together in a relational sort of sense are really real and moving. It's, mm. it's beautifully done. This is not played all for, for, for giggles at all. I find that really... Uh, I watched it again last night for, I don't know, maybe the fifth time or something mm. like that. And, uh, and I remember the last time I watched it as well, I had the same reaction, which was I was laughing, but I really... I sobbed really hardly at a couple of points last night. I think the connection with, you know, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact we're all teachers and we're teaching in communities that are low socioeconomic. So characters like Ricky Baker are in my classrooms every day. Mm. Um, and I think just the, the, the fact that he's a, a kid that he's literally told in the first few moments of the film, nobody wants you. Um, mm. And he finds this really loving relationship with um, the Rima Te Weata character. And then, of course, the developing relationship with him and Uncle Heck is... It's really affecting, and to think that here's this just this kid who just is really happy, but actually there's deep sadness there. And, and I agree with you. And, and Taika Waititi, all of his films, he's able to capture real sadness of life. You know, a lot of the characters are in really dire sort of situations, or they've got very kind of troubled pasts. But it's still the the joy, the, the joy of life is so mm. present in that as well. Mm. And I actually watched all of his films in preparation for this podcast. Rewatched them all last weekend. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and Boy is is incredibly yeah. sad, but very funny. And mm. I think just thinking about Boy makes me tear up. Mm. Um, mm. Some scenes in that movie, holy moly! Yeah, yeah. There's definitely the um, the shots of them cradling the baby yeah. while the and, mothers and, and, the, and the, the blood on the sheets, and that's all you see from the the child's point of view. And then there, and I've forgotten in Boy. I don't know we're not talking about boy but the, the revisiting of that and he, he realises that his dad was never in those memories and just mm, some yeah. really impressive visual storytelling but Eagle vs Shark as well you've got there's a whole family history where the main character of well not the, one of the main characters Jermaine Clement's character he's lying about where his mum is and what's happened to his brother and mm. it's funny but it's deeply sad mm. mm-hmm. it's um, kind of escape yeah. it almost seems like it's escape through humour right you kind of can deal with the sadness through humour obviously Absolutely. Yeah, and um, we I uh, rewatched Two Cars One Night just mm. for mm-hmm. just for kicks um, this week, um, having not seen it for years actually. Yeah, and same, of course, same. that was his Oscar nominated short film, um, and it's exactly the same. You've got kids yeah. who are actually in a really sad situation because mm-hmm. they are forced to just sit outside the pub where their their um, headless, nameless, faceless parents have gone into this pub for a couple of hours, and they're sitting outside in the car in two separate cars, obviously, hence the title. Mm. And the delightful interactions, the really truthful, Mm. cute, funny, not put on, really realistic, but delightful interactions between these sort of abandoned kids again. Mm. Um, sort of does seem to be a... Um, well, it is, isn't it? Obviously, it's a, it's a theme throughout a lot of well, these films. That's what struck me when I was watching these films. I realised that I've seen all of his films at the cinema. I've loved them, all of them, but I've really taken them for granted. And I think the, it's that funny thing, isn't it, that when one of our own kind of makes it on the big stage, it's like, we're like, yeah, that's one of ours. When Not that I've ever really... Felt, and not that I've ever been disrespectful towards Taika Waititi in terms of talking about his work, but I haven't afforded him the same level of kudos that I would, say, Jane Campion or mm. Peter mm. Jackson. But he has a really strong visual style. He's an auteur in terms of visual, visual and the way that his themes work in his films. And I, I really respect him for that. And in fact, he's had, he's had a better hit rate than either Peter Jackson or Jane mm. Campion in terms <laughs> of his films because all five of them have a real strength about them and a real yeah. confidence of voice. Mm. I, I would say as a visual storyteller, it's also interesting because he, he is an evolving visual storyteller as well. Um, you watch stuff like Eagle vs. Shark and even Boy, and there's bits, bits from those movies that feel really um, Wes Anderson-y. Mm. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I think it, it really jumps out at you where it's like, oh yeah, this is, this is what Wes Anderson would do. Mm. Uh, whereas you, you move on to, um, I mean, Thor Ragnarok, <laughs> Thor Ragnarok particularly, there, there's some shots there which are very obviously the work of someone with a strong artistic vision, mm. I guess he mm. and his team. Mm. Um, but that are unlike anything you've seen in a superhero movie ever. Let's, and let's talk about that. I fully agree with what you're saying. And that's, um, you know, I will say that there are a couple of 
comp- composited shots, which mm-hmm. are look, look very fake in Thor Ragnarok. Like there's the scene where they're on the, the sort of grassy, mm-hmm. yeah. grassy mm-hmm. outlook that you think, oh Do you gosh. Do think that's on purpose? No, no, definitely not. That was a reshoot. It was, wasn't it? Because yeah. in the trailer, that moment happens in a New York Why backstreet. Why was it a reshoot? Uh, there's a lot of talk about that because they showed the original version to test audiences. Um, they thought the test audiences thought the city setting didn't fit for the emotions, and so they um, they green screened everything. Oh, so no. the fact that it does look a little yeah. bit funny because the lighting is really flattened. Mm, it yeah. does, so it does yeah. look green screeny, and yeah. you never know. You know I, mean, I talk about him like I know him. I don't, but you never know with Taika whether he's kind of tapping his nose, yeah. and he's having a bit of a <laughs> wink at you, yeah. and going, "Look, this is a this is a." Big movie, or whether actually it just looks a bit crap because it was um, a reshoot, as you say. But he did say he did talk about interviews that he he you know this film doesn't necessarily have a sort of crappy on purpose style, <laughs> but then maybe it kind of does, and I'm kind of happy about that. So I don't know. Yeah, oh, I, I, I don't I, know. I would say it totally does. Did you see those outfits on those spacemen? Yeah, like foam things wobbling around. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and but even then, even I mean maybe this is lesser so, but it has the. The visual style of kind of a rundown kind of uh, future, right? Mm. We've seen so much recently in uh, Blade Runner and in Valerian, Valerian and stuff like that. Uh, what's the other one? The um, what's gone out of my head? The the big hologram characters and Jeff Goldblum's hologram is all over the city but it's not this kind of perfect hologram it's very cruddy mm. and mm. zoning in and out and even the kind of voices jittering back and forth and stuff like that yeah it's really yeah I agree with you it's got that it's got that kind of oh, what is it it's not even it's sort of as a used future but it's it's just not it's not taking itself too seriously you know yeah. nothing's taken and that's part of the beauty of this film I think that mm-hmm. it's still that Marvel you know there's still got a certain amount of fatigue about it from my perspective but Man, it's just <laughs> it just doesn't take itself too seriously at all. But back, back to the visuals, there's like the, the guards, like mm-hmm. there's the there's kind of techno mm-hmm. '80s Tron like guards. Yeah. Um, the set is kind of strangely garish. Colors. A lot of it's very over the top as well. You know, like mm. sometimes you see in the background people have got these guns that are kind of mangled and yeah. twisting and huge, and they've got big. Um, neon lights plugged into them and all that kind of. I, I mean, it's drawing so. heavily from the work of uh, Josh Kirby. Um, and I, I'm so happy, like, Gardens of the Galaxy started it, but this is going full Josh Kirby, where, uh, I mean, Josh Kirby was all about the, the real, like, geometric neon shapes decorating every single, every single surface you can think of. Mm. Um, the, the weird helmets, the, the weird shadows, when Kate Blanchett's character appears, that, that real kind of quasi-crackly effect... Mm. It looks like it's just jumping out from a comics page. It's, just, mm. it's really, really nicely done. Nice. What were the scenes, William, that you were referring to that you say have never been seen before? Um, what sort of aesthetic? I, I would say not the Josh Kirby scenes, but more like um, I, I've seen reviewers refer to them as airbrushed paintings on the sides of vans. Mm. Uh, there's a scene with a dragon, uh, which is, I mean, it's half a second long, but I went, whoa. Mm-hmm. There's also scenes, scenes with Valkyries. That's also in the trailer. Oh, that there's slow a, motion. That's, 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 oh that's my favourite shot. And I thought it was phenomenal. Which reminded me of Kanye West's music video for Power. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, nice. Kind of moving, where it's, moving it's pieces. A, yes, where it's very, very slow motion. I mean, I mm. don't know how long the actual... Uh, piece of footage was mm. but he managed to stretch it into a two and a half minute music video or something but it's very very slow motion yeah. and apparently um, designed to look like um, um, uh, not, uh, I guess like a renaissance painting mm. or something so a tableau mm. and then everything when they're, they're you know the characters are stomping their their spears on the ground and the flesh is rippling and that mm. and so that from the trailer mm. I thought, oh wow, there's going to be heaps more of that. I don't, I don't feel I saw a lot of that. In I think it was just what was in the trailer. I think what was in the trailer was all of those shots. Mm. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, they were yeah. amazing shots. The, the, and just to describe them for the audience, if you haven't seen it, it's yeah. beautiful slow motion, starkly lit, um, and we've got uh, the actual um, what are they called? The Valkyrie. Valkyries, yeah. yeah, flying through the air but getting speared by. Yeah. Um, Kate Blanchett's what, what character. Is, let's talk about that because talk about Kate Blanchett and and I guess maybe then a wider discussion about the cast. But I thought she was such a fantastic villain in this film. She just owned every scene that she Amazing. was in, and I just loved really, her. really um, very uh, sexy. I guess in terms of her outfit, I was mm. really surprised that they yeah. she was wearing this kind of like leotard style thing, and yeah. she was very kind of 
very um, what am I looking for? Sort of swaying. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. But there's a real she, sexuality she, she, about she, it. She was constantly kind of yeah. moving just a little bit, wasn't she? Yeah. I th- it's interesting you say that because I looked carefully at her costume in the wake of Wonder Woman. Mm. Um, and I thought, you know, because now everyone's going to be so conscious. Well, you, you'd hope so, actually. I'm seeing Justice League uh, on Wednesday and we'll see how oh, conscious they are about the uh, personification well, or the representation of women. And let us know how conscious you will be at the end of the film because I think I would probably have fallen asleep. Right, I, <laughs> I, I imagine. <laughs> but, but interestingly, I thought that Kate Blanchett's um, black, sort of almost uh, Catwoman-ish sort of suit just s- fell nicely within the bounds of um, not too sexy, not curvy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I, I thought, oh, doesn't she have a, does, doesn't she have a terrific figure for a woman in her mid-40s? Um, but not in a sexy sort of way. There was no sort of low-cut top or, mm. you know, zips or anything. Mm. And I think we've talked about this briefly with regard to Robin Wright and yeah, Blade Runner that. as well. Yeah, yeah. So really, it felt to me like her outfit is functional enough to be mm. justified um, and it's form fitting without mm. being. You remember when? Um, well, maybe you don't. But when I think it was when Catwoman came out. Um, was it Batman Returns? Halle Berry oh, and Michelle Pfeiffer that, that had to be sewn into uh, yeah. the suit. They didn't even have zips or whatever for it. It was supposed to be so form fitting for whomever it was. I don't mm. remember that she had to be sewn in. I'm hoping that those days are over. I think that, um, this was all computer generated, and that she was wearing a dot suit, and there was oh. just her face. It was actually good lord there in terms of her movements were mimicked. Right, but I mean, I think and even even beyond the outfit, it's just the way that Beth Blanchett was acting that role. It was yeah. very feminine, and she yeah. wasn't bullish. We talked about how Robin Wright was very mm. kind of quite masculine yeah. in the Blade Runner um, mm. performance, um, you know, and it suited that role. But I think for this. It was, it was almost like, a, 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 it was reminding me of Ursula, the, the Disney sea witch from Little Mermaid, and mm. kind of owning her femininity, but still being. I wonder if it's the lipstick as well, because her lips were very prominent. Um, Kate Blanchett's in this dark purple um, mm. tone, and very, kind of, it, 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 it kind of was the centerpiece of her face, and you just followed mm. her lips, and she could make them extremely thin and mm. massively wide when she was shouting as well. Her <laughs> smile. Anyway, what about her, her sort of, her, her helmet, her weird... Yeah, yeah. And that, that never really... like Madonna's um, Frozen video. Yeah. Remember in that, where it all just <laughs> turns from um, ravens into a cloak, mm. or vice versa? Yeah, it yeah. Like and it didn't really, you know, it was just a stylistic choice, wasn't yeah. it? It felt real. It felt like it was there for a reason, but mm. they never explained it. Mm. And effectively, it was just a really great visual mm. game mm. and cue. But so, you're right. I assume you were going on to, to say that the cast is pretty amazing overall. Like, I, I, the cast lifted it hugely for me. Yeah. Um, her in particular. Um, but I found, um, what's, who's Hulk? Mark Ruffalo. He was great as well. When mm. he, that was my favourite part of the film. Him and... Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth working together was fantastic. And he just grounds Chris a mm. lot. Mm. Chris needs him, I think, because on his own he's just a bit flippant and you need that kind of slightly more grounded approach from from Ruffalo, I think. Oh, that's interesting. So like a foil almost. Yeah. I, I really, I remember from the first Thor movie being pleasantly surprised, um, less by the movie, but definitely by Chris Hemsworth's comic chops. I mm. thought he was, I thought he had a real twinkle in his eye and good timing back then. I don't remember anything about the second Thor movie. I saw it, but I don't remember a thing. <laughs> and in this one, absolutely, it was like he was given, Ta- Taika had said, go on, just yeah. do what you like, push it a bit further. And he was, Hemsworth, I'm talking about, yeah. mm. was really natural and on it, I think. Do you mm. agree? Yeah, and I, I mean, they, they talk about, Waititi talks about how 80% of the film was improvised and that they had a lot of play mm. on set. Mm. Um, and interestingly, I watched Taika Waititi do an analysis of one of the scenes and he talked about the scene where Loki, Loki and uh, Thor are in the lift and he's talking to him about oh, yeah. there's that kind of conversation they have. It's before the... Um, about help, being brothers yeah. and yeah. about... Being brothers yeah. and kind of... That, and then he said that that was the scene where they absolutely um, did no improvisation because it was really important that that tone was really strong. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was really interesting to me to hear him talk about allowing the actors to play and to get that performance from Chris Hemsworth. Mm. But equally, he's, he's not... He's not throwing the baby out of the bathwater. He knew the scenes that he needed to be mm. really intentional about. Mm. And that relationship between Loki and Hemsworth, because it is so complicated, you know, like they, they keep playing on the same gag. That, like, and they even, they even explicitly address that in the film, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Loki, you're always the mischievous one and you're always going to screw me over and I'm always the one that believes you. And, and, um, but to get that right, I think he, 
Taika Waititi was very yeah, intentional. And it's kind of interesting if it is so much improv. <coughs> at the start, there was a few jokes for me that were a little bit more flat, kind of like, just felt like they were just chucked in. And that was kind of a bit weird, but it becomes the part of the tone mm. yes. of the yeah. film. And then later on, it's it's not like they're trying to go for a big gag. It's just no. like, oh, we're just playing around. Yeah. It's yeah, like, you yeah. can laugh if you want, but sh- geez, I don't really care if you don't get it. Then And then, of course, there's some big ones and there's some small ones. And so that's quite nice. You've actually. probably nailed mm. Taika's whole filmmaking <laughs> attitude, yeah. you know? Because you're right. It's such a subtle... I mean, well, I, th- I think it is. You're right. I think it's a subtle humour. It isn't big, hey, we just made a mm. joke. Mm. It's the sort of thing like when he's, um, this is not a spoiler, when uh, Thor is hanging in the chains and then and the big monster's talking to him. And he's like, hold on, hold on. And we all know what it is yeah. to be on a swing, for example, with two mm. chains mm. and you whirl yourself around and, and then you have to wait for it to come back round. Mm. And it's those kind of just subtle, um, accessible, relatable little mm. little jokes that make it delightful. But you're right; it's they're sort of the, the, they're strewn through the film. Mm. But, um, it, but it's no big deal if you laugh or if you don't laugh. I would agree with you, um, Max, as well. That it took me a, it took me aback when I watched watch this film. I was so taken aback at how um, how frivolous the film felt or mm. um, how much it wasn't taking itself too seriously that initially I was like oh do I like this this is mm. quite <laughs> this is very different and then once I kind of got into the groove of the film I just had an absolute blast yeah. but it did take me a while it was a pretty major tonal shift from any other thing that yeah. Marvel's really done eh? mm. and, and I, I will say um, yeah it took me about 20 minutes I think after the introduction of Kate Blanchett's character that's when I, I really felt the groove of the movie because mm. the, the beginning and with the, the big fire fire and the the, the chains and stuff that was when I, I felt the jokes didn't really work for me um, mm. I, I don't know what I was uh, what I was really expecting mm. um, but something about something about all that stuff and the the Doctor Strange cameo and, oh, and yeah. it felt rushed and okay. off so and let's get into it so <laughs> okay. see I loved all that stuff, oh. and then second half of the film, I was like, "Oh, this has got." I'm not laughing very much. Oh, that was this my favorite part. Very ordinary. It's a quest, I think. <laughs> I don't really know. Mm. They're going to do something with somebody. They're in a spaceship. I no longer really care. Mm. So that's interesting. But go. Just, yeah. just, oh, sorry, mate. Uh, yeah. Just the the first the first I would say twenty minutes felt so truncated and rough. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until we get to, as you say, the, the, the quest, you know, kind of um, a narrative that everything started falling into place. And I, I felt that the jokes had more, more room to breathe and the characters had more time to shine individually and also in the, the ensembles that we find mm. them in. Mm. Completely agree. So I was coming into this and I was actually, I was pretty critical actually of this film in a lot of ways. Um, I got into the groove, same kind of place as you probably, but the start is kind of pretty crap to me in a lot of ways i felt i felt like um the first scene after he's been down in the in hell is really flat and it's got lots of dialogic um exposition so exposition through purely through talking which i felt like didn't have any tension i don't know if it was at the zone i was in or anything but i just switched off it was like i was and so i kind of didn't know when they went to Earth and they saw Doctor Strange and then they shot off to uh, another place where um, they saw um, Odin. It was kind of like they were just zooming around right at the start of the film before they'd really established a location of where the film was kind of set. And so I didn't get any kind of sense of... I think that's a fair criticism. If you think of you guys as English teachers, probably you know the hero's journey. Mm. And you start somewhere and you Mm. kind of establish a location and then you have the journey which goes outside of your location, goes somewhere, and then you come back to your original Mm. place. Mm. And that's really satisfying because you know the place from the beginning. Mm. And when you get back there, it's a resolution. So you go, oh, great, we're back here. I wonder if I think what um, William's saying in terms of the introduction of Kate Blanchett is that's when the story really kicks off. Probably because that is where the story kicks off. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got this James Bond introduction with the the, the flame demon. Um, then you've effectively got cleanup from the previous films with Odin and Loki and Loki and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got Marvel uh, studio head injecting <laughs> exactly. um, that's connection, connection to other films terrible with Doctor stuff. Strange to sort of shoehorn into the Just story. Just crowbar it in. Yeah. yeah, so I think that that's a fair criticism. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm of probably both minds and that I actually still really enjoyed that opening sequence like Sarah, but inequally was really enamoured with it by the end. My only issue was 
um, the, the fact that it was so jarring it took me a while to get my head around mm. <laughs> it doesn't it just doesn't set you into the film once Kate Blanchett's in there and once we have a bit of stability in the place when we know that we're actually going to be at the junkyard plant for a little while and we're starting to develop some characters it's more fun you've got Chris and, and, and Ruffalo working off each other that's where it kind of slows down and you're like okay let's learn meet these characters talking about that Jeff Goldblum mm. was so much fun I had such a joy watching him and just he clearly was having a lot of fun improvising mm. and there's a part where he asks Rachel House's character he says you know what does it smell like and she says burnt toast <laughs> and he giggles and I reckon that was a genuine mm. giggle like, I, I, I reckon that that was you know because it doesn't really make sense why he would giggle at that apart from the fact that he just as an actor was laughing at her little that, joke that's probably like quite a it's such an improv kind of thing eh? like they probably did that scene 20 times and go okay Think how about we do things. it we'll do it give you a little sentence starter and like, yeah. Yeah, you know and then you give me back whatever comes to your mind you know, like. <laughs> that's really interesting I, I think this, is feel, this feels really interesting to me because mm. I feel as though we have three or maybe four quite different perspectives on the things that we liked and mm. and I wouldn't say didn't like but kind of that worked for us or didn't mm. and my big thought through the whole film was <laughs> here I am in a New Zealand audience um and we all get this because we get him because we've seen his films and I know some of his films have done really well abroad I totally get that but this still feels to me like a quintessentially, hey guys, look, I'm doing a Hollywood movie, but I'm going to inject heaps of Kiwiana into this yeah. for you guys. And that we're all like, we're in on it. And we're like, yeah, he's, for, he's doing this for us. So I was very concerned about how the film would be received internationally. Well, now that was weeks ago. And obviously internationally, the film's been very well received and audiences are loving it. And they totally get the humor and they think the rock monster is really funny and... And that's all neat. And I still don't really know what I think about all that. Um, well, it's, it's not only has it been well-received, it's been really well-received. Yeah. Like, it has been pretty much widely embraced. I, I think I read a, a review from um, a, a, a London paper that was quite critical, but I didn't agree with any, any of their criticisms because I just didn't agree. But, yeah, it's, it's like 95 or now 93% yeah. on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, for a big, for a 19th Marvel film or whatever it is, I mean, it's pretty damned impressive. Anyways, yeah. carry on. I was just thinking that... No, the, the, I mean, what you say is true. And I guess if I'm just gazing at you in kind of an incredulous way, for me it was a solid three-and-a-half-star film, but Doctor Strange for me was my fifth top film of mm. last year. Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it. Five stars. Everything about it worked for me. It was clever. It was thought-provoking. It was spectacular. The acting was sublime, blah, blah, blah. So mm. actually, I loved the Doctor Strange cameo in this film mm. because I love collision of stuff. Mm but I'm quite simple-minded. Um, but, but otherwise, I was like, but otherwise, this is kind of a story that, like I say, and maybe I shouldn't be so, not exactly proud, but so kind of um, open about this, I couldn't really tell you what the plot was. Mm. Um, and, um, and so I feel as though, for me, the good bits were kind of that lovely tone and, and the music always mm. the type of music and the, the beauty of it, so the aesthetic, great performances, lovely, um, and some lovely humorous bits. But other than that, it wasn't substantial for me. He's <laughs> no. listed off like six really no, major moments. <laughs> and I nearly wrote in my review, this is not the sum of its parts, but I thought, mm. well, I usually reserve that phrase for something that I'm really saying is a bit of a rubbish film, but mm. look, it has good bits and it was, and it's, it's wasted them. And I don't feel that at all. Well, if it, just, to, just to kind of segue, if we're talking about favourite films of last year, I mean, Hunt for the World of People was one of my top films yes, of last I, year. I think it was Mine all about this. Yeah, yeah. It, was, yeah. it was up there in that discussion. And I, I think, um, you know, that film, in terms of watching it as a New Zealand audience, it took me three times to get to that film because I went two times without booking well, that's in right. advance. Yeah. Yeah. And it was sold out. out. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the context, the um, not the context, the uh, this film has really injected itself into Kiwi culture. Wilder people. Wilder yeah. people, yeah. And, mm. and it's just a really impressive feat mm. of, of cinema. I was laughing last night watching it again because I'd forgotten the Lord of the Rings joke when they're, <laughs> they're sitting underneath the tree and he sort of whispers <laughs> Lord of the Rings, you know. Mm. Um, but there's something about um, what Taika Waititi has done in terms of capturing Kiwiana mm. in a way that's really impressive and... and um, now, yeah. is, is it impressive in a Kiwi context? Boy, eagle versus shark, etc., etc. I would say, yeah, it's impressive, but mm. totally works, and we're all lapping it up, and we're delighted. Okay, so here's a provocative question. 
If you are given a Hollywood movie, and I'm not saying all movies have to be made for Americans, but if you are given the 19th movie in an incredibly large franchise, how appropriate, in inverted commas, is it for you to bring in all of your national um, humour or, um, what do I mean, um, not exactly traits or whatever, but to make it a, almost a quintessentially Kiwi film. In some ways it's our tongue. But, but is, it, mm. is it a quintessentially Kiwi film? Because mm. I, I also feel like, I, I know Water People is very Kiwi, but yeah. it was also widely <laughs> embraced by the international film. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, and I mean, what we do in the shadows is very Kiwi. Uh, yes. It's not just Kiwi, it's Wellingtonian. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, and yet people say it's the funniest film of the decade. Mm. I would agree. But those are quintessentially Kiwi films because <laughs> they are set in New Zealand. And it's a bit like when we see a foreign film. It's a bit like when we see um, a hijacking or that avalanche mm. movie, the name I can never remember. Or, you know, do you know what I mean? Force yeah, majeure. Majeure. Um, <laughs> so do you know what I mean? We watch those and we go, well, this is a foreign film. It's from that country. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting is... Taika's got an essentially American film and he has brought a lot of his own stuff to it. I admire him enormously and I admire the studios who said, yeah, mate, no, just go for it, that's fine, and didn't cut it out in dailies or, you know, give, give him grief about it. But I just, I, I've been trying to think, mm. what other sort of... Well, yeah, and I, I, appropriate is really the wrong sort. It's probably too judgmental a term. The only person I come up with is Neil Blomkamp. Right, with um, Elysium, I suppose. Mm-hmm. District 9. Well, no, District 9 was a South African feeling right. film. Yeah. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Whereas Elysium was suddenly him being given this, mm, yeah. this movie. Um, and I was thinking, all right, well, how much did he bring his South Africanism into yeah. that film, aside from obviously filming it there? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And I would challenge you because I think that, um, again, and, and you t- correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's, it's underestimating how much Taika Waititi has impacted our identity of Kiwi cinema because before Flood of the Concords and Rest Derby I would argue that this sort of self-deprecating humour was a widely accepted <clears throat> part of Kiwi culture Yeah. Um, and that uh, you know sure there's been Billy T. James and things like that before but until Flood of the Concords you know that was that was so new and we were so identified with that sort of you know we're Kiwis in New York and we don't really know what's going yeah, on yeah. and he was a very much he was instrumental in that TV series True. with Jermaine Clement and, and um Brett, I forget his last name. McKenzie. McKenzie. Um, and so I would say that, you know, the last 17 or 15 years, whatever it's been, 2003 was two cars one night, um, I think that he has had a real impact on what we view as New Zealand cinema. So, so the export of our I, culture I, I, into other cinema? Or? Well, no, I think that part of what you're attributing to being very Kiwi is actually just very Waititi. And that it's, yeah. his, it's his style, and he's, see. he's bringing his his style to the Thor universe. That's why he was hired. I've, I've read interviews and heard him making that comment. That, Good point. That they were like, that's why we. That's why they got me on board. If they didn't want the style, that's why they got me on board. Good and point. And Paul Feige, is that his name? The yeah. head of Marvel Studios was like, and don't worry, if you screw it up, Kevin, we Kevin, can, Feige. Oh, Kevin Feige. Don't worry, we can fix it all in post. And effectively, yeah. they kind of did that. Didn't they? Yeah. And so that gave them immense freedom. But yeah, I just think that it's a Waititi style. You're totally right. Because Martin Campbell's gone abroad and done things. And mm. there's no quintessentially New Zealand anything. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, Campion to some extent and whatnot. So no, you're quite right. So that's what I'm responding to. One, yeah. one interesting thing about the self-deprecating humour, because everybody kind of says that that's, our, that's the aspect of the Kiwi kind of cinema that we're bringing. But then again, that's come from... That comes to us from Britain, I think. Yeah, I the office. That's, that's the office. Ricky Gervais, and we've yeah. kind of taken it and melted it into our own thing. No, Napoleon but, Dynamite was from, yeah. from the, around the same time from the States. Mm. So even yeah. that's not... It's, it's an international and, style and, of humor, And the office, the American office, is so different. Definitely twists mm. the, what, what was, you know, the more gritty, ruthless um, uh, English version. Um, but then I, I almost think that's an interesting comparison between David uh, Brent, mm. um, Ricky Gervais, uh, and Taika Waititi, Gervais, yeah. and how how long your your bag of tricks that you bring along yeah. to Hollywood can kind of last you yeah. if it's oh. humour. And uh, so it's going to be. Gervais, I think Gervais I think Waititi does the same things in everything yeah, he does. I think a very good comparison. Yeah. I think that I think the problem with Gervais is Gervais. Gervais was it's kind of just him though. And it's, I mean, with with um, Oggy, yeah, yeah. Oggy, <laughs> <laughs> Ogmaster, yeah, yeah. 
But um, whereas YTT, I think, is a much more communal filmmaker and probably a lot mm. better at drawing on different people's uh, what they bring and and you know the fact that he's doing this through improv. Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic that he's not just saying do it like I do it because I've got this brilliant mind. Mm. He's he's bringing people in and, and and using their skills, which is great. I, I love that you bring up the uh, Ricky Gervais comparison, Max, because if you look at Ricky Gervais's work after The Office. Um, it is it is such a singular voice. Mm. Uh, have you guys seen like Ghost World and what, what yeah. were the, it, It's all. I mean, it gets really boring really fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, he is a staunch, you know, atheist, and he is he has a very particular type of comedy, and these two things just he pushes in every single one of his mm, works. Yeah, and it's so overbearing. Yeah, and, yeah. It doesn't also arrogant. help that he kind of. He skyrocketed, I think, and so the arrogance he had really did become like, look, what I've got is obviously brilliant, and I'm just going to exploit it for all it is, you know? Oh, Invention of Lying was the other one. Yeah. Oh, I, hate, I couldn't stand that film, because it was one joke, and it was like, this is just frustrating. Extras yeah. was brilliant, though. Oh. Extras was... Maybe, maybe like, that's a Steve Merchant thing, kind of holding yeah. Derek, uh, Derek is very good as well. Oh, yeah. You know, Derek is good. I think, um, to bring it back to YTT, I think, yeah, I think that's always the case with comedies. How long can your bag of tricks last? Mm -hmm. But one of the things, I was talking to my dad about uh, Hunt for the World People last night, and Thor, and we were just, he was saying to me, you know, Taika Waititi clearly loves the human aspect of, of mm. you know, that's what he's caring about is, yeah. is the human aspect of the relationships in films. And I would give him that, that, it, that all of his films, whether it's on Asgard or um, in the outback of, of New Zealand's bush, um, it's, it's fully driven by character and by those human moments and this mm. human, their heart. Yeah. They have a heart, yeah. Um, and actually, to talk about Thor, just in terms of being a big budget film, one of the things I felt as well was that the action was very driven by character. It almost didn't feel like there was... It didn't really feel like there was action happening sometimes no, when there was. hardly at all, yeah. I mean, there was, because when I watched it again, I was like, actually, there's a whole lot of action happening. But <laughs> none of it's play, None of it's that kind of like, you know, flipping, what is it, Man of Steel, when they're just for 20 minutes fighting around a city. Mm. It's just... Glass and steel exploding everywhere. It's just... It's not that sort of storytelling, is it? Mm. He's, he's really... It's driven by character. Yeah, I think he did say that a lot when he went into it. People interviewed him, and he said, you know, I really want this to be character-focused. Mm. But you feel that, eh? Really mm. strongly. So here's the thing. I think it's really interesting we're talking about um, how long can you... Uh, bag of tricks sounds almost a little bit pejorative, and we mm. don't mean that. We mm. respect you entirely, yeah. Taika, when you're listening to this, and we think that you are a true genius. But it's really good I kind of hope he hasn't actually listened to this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for calling his first act crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is, right, he's not going to be given another Marvel movie because that's not how it works, right? They mm. give them to different directors and I think that's a wise move because then you've got your fairly generic sort of template um, and then you've got different artists doing the painting, which yeah. I think is the way mm -hmm. to go. And, uh, and it did occur to me just now were it not for the fact that nobody should ever watch a Woody Allen film ever again, wouldn't it be fabulous to see a Woody Allen Marvel movie? You know, with all, oh of, with all of his neurosis, shit. Yeah. absolutely, <laughs> which would be wonderful, right? Yeah. But um, so the, the, the Who, which character would he take? Who's the most neurotic? <laughs> yeah, uh, probably Bruce Bad Hulk. Hulk. Yeah, Bruce yeah, Hulk. Right. Oh my god, <laughs> yeah. Hulk. Mind you, yeah. we did have an Ang Lee Hulk, and it was terrible. And I love <laughs> well, Ang Lee. That's true, but um. So the thing is, as long as Taika continues to um, ply his trade around um, Hollywood and doing lots of different films, then yes, it probably will be sustainable. It can have, everything can have that lovely Taika feel mm. uh, and work just nicely. I, I just um, I, I just hear this conversation and think, oh man, remember Ant Man? Mm. Mm. Remember when Edgar Wright spent ten years working on Ant Man and then was booted off the project? What what movie that could have been? Better. I wonder if they that, that experience they would have learned a lot from mm -hmm. that. You know, I feel like one of the things that I will give Marvel is that they are really working hard to keep their films good. Mm. Um, and even though I'm sick of superheroes, um, I I you know I'm going to go see Black Panther, and I'm sure it's going to be a great oh, film. Yeah. You know, that looks that's something really different and Who's interesting. Directing it? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, you can. Um, and you know, I really enjoyed Wonder Woman. I really enjoyed Thor despite being sick of these films. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I really take my hat off to them for um, challenging themselves. They're clearly really challenging their practices and, mm -hmm. and keeping creativity at the forefront of whatever they're doing. Yeah. But you know what? Is, so we've talked about him bringing the Kiwi-ness, or perhaps not, or bringing the Taika Waititi-ness, and that's totally... 
how they're able to reinvent themselves is mm. by going, giving, being willing to actually really give people the space to bring their own qualities to it. Which is admirable for a it billion is. dollar company, yeah. billion dollar franchise, multi-billion dollar franchise, whatever it is. Yeah. It's really admirable. Just to say, Black Panther's directed by Ryan Coogler. I'd forgotten. Mm. And he's the chap who did Creed, which I thought was a wonderful film. And, uh, and Fruit, 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 Fruit Bell Station. Station. So, what about this film, though? So what is... In terms of anything but the comedy and a bit of visual flair, what is it and what does it do anything for you guys? Is it what, does Thor? It ha- yes. Oh does my gosh, yes. Okay, does let's talk about this. Does let's talk about any... this. Colonization. Oh, the... Colonization is a massive oh, theme in that film. In... With, um, it's in there. With but Blanchett. Only if you notice. Blanchett um, destroying the narrative that yeah. they're telling themselves about yeah. them and yes. then seeing the hurt. You've got um, the story of uh, Valkyrie, and it's subtle, but it's there. You've got Valkyrie, the Valkyrie character drinking away her displacement. Yeah. You've yeah. got mm-hmm. um, Hulk dealing with his pain by effectively um, borrowing and shutting himself off the world and, and giving in to his addictions, or mm-hmm. however you want to read the greening up of Hulk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and also you've got. Um, Whole narratives in there about. Oh, I don't want to spoil. And then the you, film, you, you have yeah. the end of the movie, which yes, I think yeah. really drives the point home. Yeah, which we can't talk about yeah. without but looking at. What do but you so think d- that Joe, average audience member, or even me, Josephine, <laughs> average audience <laughs> member, is going to pick up on all that? Because uh, I, I didn't. I, I would say it, it becomes explicit in, at one point where Kate Blanchett says, "Well, where do you think all this gold came from?" Yes. Um, yes. Which, uh, at least to me, that was when. Oh, okay. This is this is really cool. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. it, it is. It is. Uh, unfortunately quite shallow and uh, mm. it doesn't go into it in much detail but it's definitely there I would mm. say I, I always think so as well and I, I think that these films um, you, you know this sort of storytelling it needs to be uh, implied oh I um, see I think it needs yeah. to be implied for it to work otherwise it's too preachy like a, 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 a between the lines yeah, reading kind of, of it, is it yeah. all these different aspects that are great but they were components for me um, that weren't that big in a much wider sprawling narrative and they don't I, personally I didn't feel like they connected the dots between them very well although I'm, I'm interested to hear how you felt William about the ending bringing some of that together but, but they were kind of relatively small little parts that didn't really come together in a beautiful way for me so like I think I'm, I'm, it's admirable that they've worked on that and that's mm. part of it but for me I guess, I guess if they could have done that, this film could have been an absolute, you know, blo- a film that blew you away. Yeah. I guess, mm. yeah, that's possibly where you're on agreement. Because yeah. I feel like it did do that and it did blow me away. Because I was really? so impressed that this Marvel action movie had a real weight in terms of message around, again, colonisation and displacement of people. Okay, so let's say we ignore that. Um, I would say the movie still has a lot of strength, mainly just in the character. Um yeah, it's, it's a little shaggy dog in places, but I, I would say just hanging out with these characters and the various character pairings um, totally makes the movie, movie worthwhile. It's mm. almost a Richard Linklater in a way. Oh, mm. yes. Yeah. Um, my husband said the same thing, actually. Oh, cool. Um, he did say that it felt a little... Um, he didn't say slacker necessarily, but, but a little <laughs> bit Richard linklater hangy hangy-outy mm. yeah. kind of thing. Thank you for listening to another episode of Cinema in Context. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please share it with your film-loving friends. You can listen to Cinema in Context through SoundCloud or through Apple Podcasts. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, which are also great places to let us know what you think of this episode and give us suggestions for future films to discuss and compare. Look out for our next episode in a month's time, which will be our wrap-up of 2017. And until then, ka kite anō.